give me a pretty good billing. So uh, now I have to perform. It's pretty hard to follow Pastor Corey's footsteps because he's pretty dynamic. Uh, I am so uh, grateful that we have great leadership in our church. Uh, it, we have to have leadership to go someplace. And we are going someplace under uh, the leadership of Pastor Corey and Aaron. And we are so glad that they get a break. They get to, to uh, take off and, and uh, get a few weeks off and, and not have to think about this. In fact, they even thought, they forgot last night that we had team. And they were trying to FaceTime us. And we said, we're having team. So we had to just correct them a little bit. Thank you, music ministry, for always being so faithful and dynamic. I love that. It really sets us up. And uh, so I'm, I'm so grateful that I get to preach. First time I get to preach in this church. Uh, yeah, they, they wanted to keep me away. But uh, finally I got a spot. As soon as Pastor Corey found out I'm preaching today, he leaves. <laughs> and then he found out I'm preaching next week too. And he takes his family and leaves. <laughs> and they, they go to Disney World of all places. Mickey Mouse over Pastor Richard. That's the way it's shown up. But I know Pastor Corey, he's gone there to be healed from a childhood trauma because we, we took him to Disneyland in California, in Anaheim, when we, um, just before we moved there. We lived there three years. And uh, so we, we uh, took them, uh, the kids, you know, he was not Pastor Corey, he was Kid Corey, Corey the Kid. And so we took him there and he met Mickey Mouse for the first time, and of course, Mickey Mouse was this big, and Corey the Kid was this big, and he could not believe that this, this Mickey Mouse with these big ears, uh, and, he, and he was so forward with him. You know, he's shaking his hand, and Corey's withdrawing, because he's terrified of this Mickey Mouse. And so uh, we, we tried to settle him down. Uh, this is my wife, Pastor Beth, by the way, for those of you who are you in the church. Yeah. So she's my first wife, and... She threatened me that she will be my last wife, too. <laughs> so she's trying to calm him down, this little kid. She's calming him down. She, uh, Corey, he, it's just a, it's a man in there in, in that costume. And, you know, he's, he, he's just wearing this thing. And, and there's a zipper in the back. He just gets in. He opens a zipper, and he gets in from the back, and he zip it up. And he looks at her, and he says, a zipper? So he goes, he's going to find a zipper. <laughs> he's got to validate her words. So he goes behind and he starts fooling around with Mickey's zipper, trying to find his zipper and tugging at his costume. And, and pretty soon, Mickey's, uh, he's, he's irritated by this little kid. And he's slapping behind him and, and he's trying to get away and he's trying to walk away and slapping behind him. He was, going to, he was determined he was going to find out if there's really a person inside there. So I think that was quite traumatic. So let's pray he's going to get healed this time at, at Disney World. So he gets over Mickey Mouse. Anyway, um, we're glad they're having a great time. We had a FaceTime with them. And, and uh, uh, I don't know why, just because I'm preaching today, you know, I, people, people went as far away as West, Jet would, as West, West Jet would fly them. They took off this week. <laughs> they went to, to Ontario and some, some got in their vehicles. They drove to Winnipeg. They didn't want to fly with WestJet, so they flew. They drove to Winnipeg. Some, a bunch of them got on their motorcycles and went out of province. They, they just went to BC. They say, we got to get out of town. Pastor Rich is going to preach. Anyway, I, I love teaching. I'm not a preacher like Pastor Corey. Preaching gives you inspiration and, uh, you know, motivation. Teaching often gives you revelation, but to combine those two, those two giftings really can do something powerful. The Bible says Jesus went about every place he went, preaching and teaching and casting out demons, healing the sick. And uh, that was his, his work. That was his ministry. So anyway, the message I'm going to share with you today, it's, it's, I'm, I want to put a sword in your hand, if you don't mind. Um, a sword in your hand so that you can begin to deal with the giants in your lives. You know, some of us have carried giants in our lives. We've covered for those giants for too long. Giant, giants like anger and bitterness and resentment and unforgiveness. And we've got to get those giants to put their head on a block and take care of it forever. 
and that's where this message will take me in the next couple of weeks. Usually, it takes me six hours to preach this message. I've got to stuff it into two 35-minute segments. But next week, bring your lunch. We'll take care of that. I'm going to give you the, the bare bones so that you can walk after this week and next week. You can walk out of here more free than you are today. The, the goal is about, the Bible says Jesus came to set us free. Okay, and once you get to know him, who he really is, and accept that into your life, and begin to walk with him, partner with him, you will be more free than you are right now. It doesn't matter how free you are, you'll still be more free. Okay, that's what this message will do for you. And so, uh, bear with me. Um, if you want more than you can get in these next two sessions, this week and next week, then you have to join the best group and venue, the best small group, where you'll get it all. Okay, and it comes with a guarantee. So, um, join the, <laughs> you can tell they're part of my group, these guys. I didn't pay them too much either. So, we're going to condense what, we're, what I want to share with you. But um, come and get more if you want more. In the, it's a foundational teaching. It's a foundation for the, your personal life. It's a foundation for the church. You cannot even enter into the kingdom till you experience forgiveness. Can't even enter in. So it's the doorway in. And also it's the key to function in the kingdom. So that's what we're going to be talking about. Um, I want to talk about, I'm going to, I'm going to give you an introduction that, that's not related to this message specifically, but I want you to remember four words. If you're past grade four, you have to remember four words. Okay, I'm going to talk about the man. Who is this Jesus? We've got to find out who he is. We have to have the revelation of who he is, not just head knowledge, not just what somebody else believes. We need to know the man. We need to expect a miracle. If you don't expect a miracle, don't worry, you won't get one. But this message produces miracles, more miracles than I've ever seen with anything I've, I've preached. And I've been sharing this for 24 years now. Okay? That's about the time I unwrapped this device out of my box. You know this device? You know, those of you who are, who are uh, young, you probably don't know what this device is. I, I took this out of a box about 25 years ago, and um, it was fully charged. And I checked it. I checked it last night. I haven't plugged it in. It's still fully charged. So you want one of these. Don't trust Rogers. <laughs> Go to the real thing. It's guaranteed. Okay, you don't have to worry. Did I plug it in? Did I not plug it in? It's plugged in. Okay. It's, it's plugged into the man. So we're going to introduce the man. Okay, it's about the man to get a miracle. Get the message. Get it in your heart, what he wants to say to you today. Not what he's saying to you, the guy next to you who really needs Jesus. Okay? What is he saying to me today? It's about the message to put us on a mission. To give us a mission for our lives. Not just for today or tomorrow, but for the months to come, the years to come. For our lives. To put us on a mission. This is about having a mission from him. And so that's what we're going to be talking about today. I'm going to start in Luke chapter 5 today. I'm going to talk to you about... Uh, uh, one of my favorite passages in the scripture, uh, Jesus' uh, teaching on a certain day. They gathered in a house. It must have been a fairly big house because the Bible says the scribes and Pharisees came from all over. From all over. They want to find out about this guy because they don't believe him and they got to they gotta challenge him. Okay, that's what the scribes and Pharisees did in that day. They liked tradition. They liked religion. They liked their own way. They liked control. They liked power. They did not like to give up control. And what Jesus does, he shows us how to give him control. Okay, so they're, they're gathered this day. Fill the house. Fill the whole courtyard. As far as back as, far back as they could hear, they, they filled the place. It happened on a certain day he, as he was teaching. There were Pharisees and teachers of the law. These are professionals, teachers of the law. They were sitting by. He had come from every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. The power of the Lord is present. What do you think Jesus was preaching? If it's true that the Bible says that, that, that uh, whatever you teach, that's the fruit you get. What's he teaching on? If the power of the Lord is already present to heal. It's recognized. The power is there. They could sense, they could sense it and they were already resisting. We don't want this. We like the religion we've got. We like our control. But there were some guys in the back of the crowd there. They couldn't get in because there were nobodies. There was four guys in the back of the crowd. They began to sense the presence 
of the, of the healer in, as he was teaching. And they're thinking to themselves, probably whispering in the middle of a service if they dare. <laughs> and they're saying to each other, we know a guy who needs that, what we're feeling. So they run back into town, go to the guy's house. He's probably really angry because they, they woke him up. He's sleeping on a stretcher, which was his bed. Because he was a paraplegic. He was a cripple. He was paralyzed. And he couldn't move. And he, there's no way he wanted to go to a meeting in his pajamas. <laughs> so they pick him up. And they, didn't, they probably didn't listen to all his arguments. They said, we're going to where we know you can get help. They pick him up. Four men, one of the gospels says. Four men. And, and they pick him up. Take him to the meeting. They couldn't even get near the house. Because these scribes and Pharisees, none of those teachers of the law were giving up their seat. This is my seat. This is where I criticize from, where I launch my missiles. This is my place. So I'm not giving up this seat. And so they, you know, in those days they had houses that usually they would have a, or often they had a stairway going up the side of the house to get up on the roof. Flat roof, you know, that's where all the ladies were sunbathing. So they would want to go up there. So they... They, they sneak him up there, and they start, if you can imagine the audacity, they start tearing up off the tiles of the roof. And can you imagine Jesus, the Son of God, preaching, dust falling down, not smoke like we have, but dust falling on his head, maybe a few bricks. He, maybe he's dodging some tiles so he can keep on preaching. But they were determined they were going to get him in front of Jesus because they sensed the power of healing. They sensed what the man had, and they were looking for a miracle. They had a sense, it's a, it's a day for a miracle for our friend, not just for us, for our friend. So Jesus sees their faith, and one of the scriptures says, he, he says to the, the man who's paralyzed, you know, maybe all he could do is turn his eyes or his head a little bit. He says, son, be of good cheer. Can you imagine? Coming into a meeting, disrupting everything, Jesus says, uh, have a laugh. Be of good cheer. Can you imagine? So they put him in, in front of Jesus. And what does Jesus say? He didn't say anything about healing to him as far as it's recorded. He didn't say anything about that. He said, son, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven you. And then he says, he has the audacity to say to a crippled man, well, pick up your bed and go home. So he did it. Because he got the miracle from the man. And he heard the message in his heart and he responded to it. And suddenly, he had a new mission in life. Can you imagine? Just that fast. See, that's the same Jesus we still serve and preach today. So if he'll do it for that man, why can't he do it for us? And, you know, the guy who had to get let down through the roof, you know, you'd think, well, he's got to go climb the rope and get up through the roof and go home. No, he picks up his bed and walks right through the scribes and Pharisees. You see, that's what it'll do when you receive from Jesus what he has for you. You'll, you'll pick up your bed. You'll take whatever you have, and you'll walk right through the crowd that's trying to resist him. Okay? You ready, for, you ready to hear that, this message? Boy, I, I got excited when I was think, thinking about this crippled man. Well, a, a few months ago, um, a couple came into our church. They were brought, basically, they were brought here by their friends. It's like... Um, a, a man who was paralyzed. He was paralyzed spiritually and emotionally. He was paralyzed. He could not move ahead in his life. He, could, he didn't have any hope anymore. He was paralyzed, although, you know, he could walk with his legs, you know, woodenly. But they brought him in. Family loved him enough to bring him in because they'd heard this is a place where their life happens. And he came in, and while he was here, somebody had the audacity to invite him to our small group, and he took him up on it, and they showed up at the small group. And what was I teaching? I was teaching this 24-year-old message and, and went through it. And that's why I'm inviting you to come to get the whole story because you get the in-depth story. And he got the in-depth story one day. His wife and he, he invited us over for lunch and served us a great lunch, and they had an agenda. You know, you sort of try to say, well, we just want you to have you for company, but they had an agenda. And finally, his, I, think, I think his wife said, uh, well, tell them. <laughs> you telling, you're telling on me? So he began to explain that his, in his life, from when he was five years old, 
he began to become a cripple emotionally, spiritually, because people started to wound his father. People in the church, he was a churchgoer all his life, and in the church, they began to wound his father by the things they said and how they rejected him and how they, how they handled him. And then in church and in business and in, in the community, he just kept piling up all the bitterness and the resentment and unforgiveness. And he didn't know how to deal with it till he became a cripple. He's over 70 years old now. And I, I'd like you to hear his story. He came, he came, uh, and he, he told us his story. Then he said, I need to meet with you, Pastor Richard. I said, that sounds good to me. So we came over to the church here one day. And he brings a binder with a big book in it. And his book are big pages. And he's got a list of people. Lists of people who had wounded him from when he was five years old. And he had never dealt with these issues in his life. He didn't know how to. He's told all his life, you've got to forgive, you've got to forgive. But he didn't know how to because he'd never met the forgiver in a very particular way. And so I explained it to him. And that day we sat down and he went through the list. And he began to forgive them. And I saw his countenance change right in front of my face. His step changed. He, his step became light instead of heavy. And... He's going he's gonna to tell you his story because I'm not going to tell you. Because I'd like you to hear his story from him. Because every time he tells a story, it's going to strengthen him. In his resolve to be a man after God's own heart. Okay, he's going to sit about the second or third row from the back. He's not here today. But he'll be, he'll be coming. I asked him if I could do this. He'll be coming. He's got white hair. His wife got white hair. Go up to him and say, would you tell me your story? And see what he says. I'd like him to tell you your, his story. He left a free man because Jesus encountered him where he was at. And he took the sword, the words of his mouth, and he began to cut off the heads of the giants of all, all the bitterness and resentment that accumulated in his life. Okay, we can all be free. So I wanted to tell you that story. Today I'm going to take you over to, Gen, um, to where I, I start. This message, it's going to start in, in um, Matthew chapter 16. Jesus, Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi and he asked his disciples, uh, who are these disciples anyway, by the way, do you know? You know, sometimes we, we think the disciples, the apostles of Jesus are those guys who are in the picture on grandma's dining room wall, you know, done by a professional, all these old guys gathered around Jesus, you know, staring at him. And hoping they'll get something from him. Long beards, you know, uh, all retired. Uh, and that, that's the picture we get of who the disciples were. But I don't think, I don't see that at all when I read the Bible. Jesus was a 30-year-old man. Everything they did in that day, they did by foot. They walked. If they needed to go to Jericho, they walked. If they needed to go to Jerusalem, they walked. They walked. They didn't have these scooters we got all over Airdrie here. <laughs> Tap in, drive. They walked. They didn't have cars. They didn't have bicycles in those days. So who would Jesus pick to be in his small group? Because that's what it was. He's picking a small group. See, we think it originated with venue, but it didn't. <clears throat> it originated here. My device says so. So, so they're walking every place. And when they're walking, can you imagine these guys walking? Young people, young men walking. How do I know they're young? Well, I've got a couple of illustrations in the Bible that sort of prove it to me. When Moses led the people out of the wilderness, out of their captivity, into the promised land, all the old generation died in the wilderness because they could not accept the promise. You see, when Jesus came, the scribes and Pharisees did not want to accept any kind of a promise. They wanted what they had, the old way. So he would have to take somebody from a new generation with a new mindset that's going to follow him. And be able to walk with him and go with him every place he went. When, when they challenged him about his, um, uh, if he's paying temple tax. You know, in that day, the custom, the Jewish custom, custom was you had to pay temple tax one shekel a year. Custom. And so when they challenged him about it, he turns to Peter and he says, go to the, go to the sea and the, uh, throw in a hook. And the first fish you catch, there will be a coin in his mouth. Come and pay the temple tax for you and for me. Half a shekel each. Now, if Jesus is a good home group leader, he wouldn't need to take care of the rest of his team and pay for them. So 
prop, they only had to start paying temple tax when they were 20 years old. So they were probably all under 20 years old, his disciples. I would, I would presume they would be young men that could walk with him, that would, t that would accept a change of lifestyle, that would be willing to make some, um, some changes to the old rule, the old law. When they crucified Jesus, you know who was shouting, crucify him, crucify him? It wasn't the young people. It wasn't the millennials. It was the old people. It's the old generation. Come on, you guys. We, we've got to think young. We've got to think progressive. We've got to think, how is the Holy Spirit thinking? Jesus was thinking, who? Amen. He was thinking, who can I leave this powerful message that I, I've come to redeem the world? Who can I leave this with? These old guys are going to be gone in two weeks. No. I'm going to give it to young people who are going to, they're going to stand up. They're going to change their lives. They're going to, they're going to affect their communities with this message that I've come to redeem the world. And how did Jesus redeem the world? He forgave their sins, didn't he? Yeah. So here he's talking, so he's got to reveal himself to these young men because they don't know anything about what he's going to be teaching them. So he had to lay foundation. That same foundation is still laid in the church today, but many people haven't got it. We've got to take that foundation and keep building on it. So he came into the region of Caesarea Philippi. They're walking. Can you imagine 13 guys walking along, you know, jostling each other, having a little fun, uh, slapping, telling jokes, slapping around. Jesus, he, he starts a teaching moment. Okay. He says to them, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? And so they said, you know, what he's saying is, what's the word on the street, you guys? Who am I? How, how am I being represented? And they said, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them this very interesting question, but who do you say that I am? And that's where we're going today. Who do you say Jesus is? Not who does your wife, who does your husband say Jesus is? Who does your pastor say Jesus is? What about your grandchildren? Who do they say Jesus is? No, it's about who do you say Jesus is? Because whoever you say he is, that's what you're going to transmit to other people. And if you paint a negative picture of Jesus, that's what the young, younger generation will pick up. But Jesus wants a new message for a new generation. Okay, that's got nothing to do with the year, years of your age. It's about your mentality. It's about what am I willing to accept? How, what's the Holy Spirit doing? Can I flow with him? Praise God. So he said, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. That means redeemer, you know. Peter had a little bit of an understanding of who Jesus was. And so he spoke out. He's quick to speak out what he's got. So he spoke it out. And the others are probably sitting there. What? What's he saying? Simon Peter. He's the only one that was married at the group, I think. And uh, the others are, you know, all pretty young. And uh, sometimes we think these young guys, we, if you think young, if you think, think these young guys, oh, they were prof some pre preachers have said they're professional fishermen. So that's why they were so upset in the boat when the, you know, the waves were big and they were professional fishermen. I don't think so. I think their father was a professional fisherman. These guys could hardly wait to get out of that boat and quit stinking like fish. They ask a girl out and she says, you smell like fish. And there's no nightlife because they got to fish all night and catch nothing. So you call that professional? I don't think that's professional at all. I think that's a failure. And I think they were just glad to get rid of that boat, get out of that boat, and, and get away from their dad who was making them fish at night. How about Matthew, the tax collector? Can you imagine? Everybody in the city hates tax collectors, and here he's, his father's trying to train him to be a tax collector, apprentice tax collector. And when Jesus comes by and he says, follow me, Man, it didn't take him. He didn't have to have a prayer meeting even. He was out of there that fast. Because he didn't want, want to be hated like his family was hated. So, you know, these guys, they were young guys. They were ready for something new. Probably wandering. You know, there's one guy, Jesus said, yeah, I saw you under the tree over there. Probably the guy on welfare. And he, he calls him and he says, follow me. I think these young guys were ready for a change. And that's what I ask myself today. How many people in the church are ready for a change today so that they can be somebody tomorrow? They can bear fruit, fruit tomorrow. So Simon answered him. He, he gave him the right question. 
You're the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who's in heaven. See, Jesus has to be known by revelation. You can't just understand Jesus and his power and his, and his ways with your intellect. It's got to go beyond that. It's got to come into your heart so that your heart can train your mind so you really know who Jesus is. It's got to be by revelation. He said, Simon, you've got it. The Father has revealed just a little bit of who I am, but I'm going to, he's, going to, he's going to enhance that. He's going to make it real to all of his disciples. You know, all the no-name guys that nobody ever remembers what their name was. Yeah, that's sort of like us. We don't have a platform like Peter, James, and John and Judas. And then Jesus says to him, Jesus' words, and I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I'm going to build my church. That word church means family. I'm going to build my family. He said, I'm going to. He said, he, not, he didn't say, I'm going to try. Let's have a go at it. He said, I am going to build my church. That's you. That's me. I am going to build my church. And the gates of Hades, hell, let's use hell. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. In other words, everything that Satan tries, we are going to take the sword that you put in our mouth and we'll put it to death. Yeah. Everything the devil tries. You know, the devil has tried your whole life to get you full of unforgiveness and bitterness and resentment and, resentment and anger so that he can control you. Whoever falls into those categories, uh, having that in their heart, the devil controls them. Maybe not, maybe not fully, but he controls a lot of what they do and how they move. So he said, on this rock, I'll build my church. What rock? On the rock of the revelation of who Jesus is. So today our question is to you, who do you say Jesus is? Okay, we're going to try to reveal that to you today and next week. Don't, don't miss next week. Then he says this amazing thing. He says, and I, Jesus himself, will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Not the keys to, the keys of. Okay, I'm going to give you the keys, show you how to function in the kingdom. Once you are in the kingdom, I'm going to give you the keys. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. In other words, whatever you bind on earth, I'm going to agree from heaven and it will be bound. And whatever you loose on earth, I'm going to loose from heaven and it will be loosed. I'm going to validate. I'm going to guarantee. I'm going to enforce whatever you bind and loose. So when we first got this message, we thought this is going to be fun. We started to bind the devil. You, did you know Jesus never bound the devil? Pastor Corey said he sent him into pigs. He didn't. If he bound him, he couldn't go. They couldn't go into pigs, could they? Yeah. So he he loosed him. He cast them out. He told him to shut up. You know, we think we think in nice terms. Jesus told the demoniac who's who's screaming out, "You're Jesus, the Son of God." We think Jesus would say, oh, "Muffle it, boy. Just take it easy. Be nice. Nice words." I don't think it worked that way. I think Jesus said, "Shut up." That's how you deal with the devil. Okay? You're not becoming his friend. So we used to we used to bind and loose. We used to especially loose finances because we're all broke. And so we'd loose finances. I I say in Jesus, we use the name. I used to say in Jesus' name, my bank account's gonna be filled up. And I'd go and check the next day and darn it was lower. And and, and I I bind the the devil from working in my finances and Next day, I still more broken. I, I owed more money. Okay, so I didn't know what this. I didn't know how to relate to this passage of scripture. I, I read it all wrong. The words are right, but I want to take you to the book of John, chapter twenty. We're going to look what this look at what this really meant. You know, Jesus had been crucified, dead and buried, gone. His disciples said, "That's it. It's over for us." Text all our friends. Let them know we're not coming home. We're locked up. Here in the Jews, they're, they're coming to get us Jews too. The Jews are coming to get us Jews so they can crucify us. And so uh, they're, in a, they're locked up in this place the same day at evening, it says. That's after the resurrection. Um, being the first day of the week when the doors were shut where the disciples were, they, where they were assembled for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, peace be with you. Peace to you. Can you imagine? They're all terrified. They're all huddled in the corner. No candles lit. Okay? Because they wanted to stay in the dark so nobody would see them. Suddenly Jesus appears. Can you imagine? A, a ghost? 
Okay? You think, you know, we read it and, and we modify it a lot in our minds. We think, oh, well, nice, Jesus is here. But they're, they're terrified. And he suddenly appears and then he says this crazy thing to them, peace be to you. Peace? Haven't you just, didn't you hear the news? You know, uh, our, our leader was crucified. They put him in a tomb. He's finished. Our, we're finished. Our ministry is finished. We have no hope left. And Jesus says, peace be to you. He does an amazing thing. How do, you, how do you deal with such a word? And now when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Sure, they were nothing but fearful, glad. Then Jesus said to them, peace be to you. He said, he said it again. If he says it twice, listen. Okay? He's validating what he said before. Peace be to you. As the Father has said, he said this amazing thing. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. So the Father sent you to get crucified. So now we're next on li in line. Is that what you're saying? As the Father sent me, I'm sending you. No, but see, the Father sent Jesus as the Redeemer to forgive people their sins. In his last message from the cross, what did he say? Father, forgive them for they don't even know what they're doing. It's not about how you feel. It's not about how what serious thing has happened to you. We're not negating any of that. But it's how you deal with it that counts. And he said, Father, forgive them. He wasn't exactly feeling good that day. Sometimes we think, well, when I feel good, when I feel like it's really in my heart, then I'll forgive somebody what they've done to me. But what do you think Jesus was feeling as he's impaled on the cross? Boy, this is really comfortable. I think I'll start forgiving people. He was in agony, but he came for obedience, not because he felt good. So he obeyed what the Father sent him to do. He forgave people their sins from the cross that day. You were forgiven that day. Maybe you haven't accepted it yet, but you were forgiven that day. Because Jesus did it by faith. He prophesied forgiveness to the world of people who are full of sin. And then an amazing thing happened. The Bible says, and he breathed on him. You know, when, when God created man and woman in the garden, the scripture says he breathed on them and the spirit of God went into them. The spirit of life, the spirit of power, the spirit of love went into them because he breathed. When he breathes, you get what he is. And he breathed into them. So Adam and Eve decided to go their own way. We'll do it our way. We want that fruit. Looks good. We'll just eat it. Who will know? Because the devil, he, he, he fooled them. He deceived them. And so they ate that's rebellion against God. And that day, that breath left them. So from that time till the time Jesus came, some 4,000 years later, they were without that breath in them. They were living beings. The devil said, you won't die. They didn't die physically. They were li still living beings. But since that time, the breath was not there. Till Jesus came along, placed himself on the altar, forgave men their sins, was crucified for us, shed his blood for us, and that day, that day, when they received that in their hearts by revelation, he breathed life into them again, that same spiritual life. That day, they got a gift. That gift is called forgiveness. Everybody who's born again, everybody's received the forgiveness of Jesus and received that breath has the spirit of forgiveness in them. If they use it or not, it's there. The spirit of forgiveness is in there. But we have to give words to it. Jesus said from the cross, he didn't just didn't think, well, uh, let, me, let me forgive him. He didn't just think it. He said it. That's how we begin to get free. We say, like Jesus said, we forgive them for they don't even know what they're doing. Somebody who has hurt you, somebody who has wounded you, you say, Pastor, you don't know how bad it is. Well, how bad was it when Jesus was hanging on the cross? That was bad. That was a serious situation. No, none of us has been in that serious a situation yet. So we can forgive because Christ has endued us with the power to forgive people their sins. That's how we, that's how we loose the spirit of life and how we bind the devil. You want to bind the devil? Forgive your neighbor. We spend a lot of time trying to bind the devil. All we have to do is forgive our neighbor and the devil is bound. That's how it works. 
So we're going to talk more about that next week. So he breathed on them and he said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. They received that life again. How wonderful that he received that. They received that life. Then he says this amazing thing. If you forgive the sins of any, are these just, this, this is in red. Okay, that's what my device has it in red. If you, not if he, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. That's what Jesus said. His, his first disciples laying the foundation of the church, his first disciples got that message. If you forgive anybody their sins, they're forgiven. But if you retain them, they're retained. In other words, if you won't forgive, you are part and parcel of what the devil is doing, trying to keep them in, in bondage, in prison, by not forgiving them. We have a great ministry, and Jesus has a great faith in us that we'll do it. Okay, Jesus is revealed to them here as the forgiver. So today, our goal is to, to have every person that we have come in contact with, every person we have opportunity to share with, to embrace this concept. I am now a forgiver, and I will forgive people their sins so that they can be free. And once that happens, I will be free also. Jesus is a forgiver. Above all things, Jesus is a forgiver. That's the man. And that's the miracle that will happen when you start to forgive people. I want to hear your testimonies of what has happened in people's lives when you start to forgive them, even though they don't hear you. But you say the words before God, I forgive that person because they wounded me or, or they, they, uh, you know, they sinned against me in some way. I want to hear the miracles that begin to happen, even without you, even without that person knowing what you have done. But Jesus knows, and he's going to validate whatever you loose, sins that are loosed, he will validate it. Thank you, Jesus. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for your amazing grace that has come to us and you trusted us with your word. You have faith in us. You prophesied it from the cross. And today we accept it as a, a life. It's a life mission for us, Lord, to forgive people their sins so that they can be free. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.